Welcome to the 21st show of Touring Texas Songwriters with our host, the long tall Texan, Mr. Bruno Michel. Today's show features Austin journeyman songwriter Bob Cheevers and is brought to you by the Barrel Brewing Company and the citizens of historic Salado, Texas. Bob Cheevers was recorded live in front of a studio audience for broadcast on Country Radio Switzerland. Sit back, relax, and listen to the stories and songs of Bob Cheevers. While he's digesting, this guy has a career that spans more than 50 years. Uh, he wrote over 3,000 songs. Imagine that. Initially coming out of Memphis, he kind of switched over to California and then had an enlightening, came back to Nashville, spent a lot of years in Nashville writing songs. And finally, in 2008, he got the kind of lightning strike from heaven and came to Texas. So since 2008, he's a member of the songwriter community here and uh, well-received, and we're happy to have him. Bob Cheevers, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. Cheers. <laughs> you good? So... Um, <laughs> I've been in Austin for 16 years, and I've been here about an hour and have had more technical difficulties in the last hour than I've had in my 16 years in Austin, uh, <laughs> uh, 10 years in Austin. Um, we met a few years, a few yeah, years, ago years ago when yeah. you came to my house yeah. and we did an interview, and, um, by, and and we had been in touch with each other for many years before long, long that. Long time, yeah. Um, it's great to be here. This is a great room. It, it, it seems like everybody's really nice. Just no, yeah. <laughs> and they usually stay that way. Yeah. Now, as he said, we we met three years ago because he put out a special CD uh, box with uh, his what was it eighty kind of greatest hits out of the three thousand. And so we did an interview for the magazine, and uh, I tried to kind of hook together some different questions than what we did three years ago, even mm -hmm. though he and I are old enough so we wouldn't remember the questions or the answers anyway, but uh, we'll try. So uh, I think let's start with the song, I guess. Well, first I'm going to, I'm just going to play a little bit on this guitar. Um, I've been writing a lot in dadgad tuning, which is uh, D A D G A D. So um, it's an it's a sort of an open tuning, and I've known about it for decades. But a friend of mine in England, whose record I'm just winding up, and we're supposed to get it tomorrow or the next day. It's it's finished. It's a it's a double album of 22 of his best songs. His name is Dave Greaves. Unfortunately, he's dying of um, what's called MSA. It's a neurological disorder. But um, he turned his a lot. So many of his songs are in this tuning, and it's and it's like learning to play the guitar all over again because you have to figure out where the chords are. It's so pretty, though. Okay, um, now I need to unplug. I can't play anything in this tuning. Sure, sure. It's, all, it's always <laughs> question answer time. I see there's only four strings. Is that? No, there's six. Really? It's that those glasses, those uh, bifocals of yours. <laughs> <laughs> Bring him back. Bring him back. You get a refund. <laughs> I asked Bruno earlier if we could edit this stuff because there, because of what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm, I'm changing the tuning. 
because I can't play any of the songs in, in that tuning because they're all new. I've written probably a dozen songs in the last month using this tuning, and I was so excited about playing them, but all of my songs are in this iPad, and um, I just switched my operating system in my Mac to Catalina just about four days ago, and it has fouled everything up. And so I can't play. Uh. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm just, uh, nothing's going right for me today, but <laughs> it's going to be a wonderful day when it gets, when it gets started. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. You all live around here, or everybody's yes. close by? Yes. Okay. Some of us are friends of Hart and some of us are friends of Linda. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One excludes the other, or what? <laughs> I'll be there in a minute. Just go ahead without me. <laughs> Any, I could answer questions while I'm doing this. If you got any questions, <laughs> like um, so, what do you normally play in Austin? I live sort of near Lakeway in Austin, and there are um, there are about four venues where I play near where we live. Um, one is a brewery. One is at that uh, oasis complex on the lake yeah. i have two places there i play twice a month each uh i play the saxon pub i have a gig coming up at thread gills those kind of places um green hall and uh that sounds pretty good Um, what would I play on it, though? Um, <laughs> uh, oh, let me look at my list. Um, none of those. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> I grew up in Memphis. And uh, between college years, I worked for a fundraising organization called Shelby United Neighbors and each each summer we'd go to Elvis's house, <clears throat> pick up a fifty thousand dollar check that he donated to this organization, which dispersed the money to um, needy organizations. And um, so we knocked on the door, or opened. And there he is, the most famous person in the world. Invited us in. Everybody shook hands. His dad. Uh, was with us. Um, his wife was in the kitchen. You remember uh, what's her name? Uh, Priscilla. Priscilla. I say Loretta. <laughs> uh, she was in the kitchen fixing, and this is all true. Fixing his favorite meal, which was a hollowed-out loaf of bread, a pound of bacon, and probably a quart of uh, um, uh, cheese. You know that uh, Velveeta. King of rock and roll. <laughs> so we're standing there, and um, Elvis handed this $50,000 check to my executive director, who said, give it to Bob. <laughs> so my knees are shaking, and I got the check in my hand, and I said, Elvis, what I'd really rather have than this money is, is, is your bathroom. So he pointed me across this white shag carpet floor, and when I walked across the floor, my feet up to my ankles was this white shag carpet. And and he has a room called the Jungle Room that has this horrible, ugly, dark green shag carpet. <laughs> have, you, have anybody been to Graceland? It's pretty weird, huh? And you And you'd think, and back then... Remember when you were little and you remember your backyard and, and it was so big and it was your world and then you go to that place now and your backyard's really small. 
So that's the way Elvis's house. Because I used to go out there when I was young, and we'd ride horses around his land because some friends of mine knew. Anyway, so I went to the used his toilet, and <clears throat> if you if you're like me, you know, hear there's ads. If you're like me, uh, but uh, when you go to somebody else's house, you just want to make sure the toilet flushes. So there, I was really. I'm in Elvis Presley's house, and I just and and it flushed, and I went out, and and, and we drove away. It's it, it's sort of an anticlimactic story, but uh, anticlimactic story. Um, but it's my story, and I know you found it incredibly fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> As you will, this song. This is called um, <laughs> I Saw the King. Uh, and uh, it goes like this. <laughs> Forty more miles to Memphis Down Highway 51 Headed through Mississippi on my Harley Davidson, just outside of Graceland, I let my motor cool down. Boys, it felt like I was standing on hallowed ground. Mm -hmm. Pink and black Eldorado came cruising up to the gate. Big man in the back seat, looking tired and overweight. He rolled down the window, I could feel time stand still. Forget that moment, boys, I don't think I ever will. I saw the king coming home to meet his maker. I saw the king. And he was headed for the promised land I saw the king At the gates of his mansion Follow my angels Lord, how they could sing Hallelujah I saw the king Gate man gave the signal, said, Let that limousine on through. I could feel the end was coming, not a thing that I could do. On a hillside up in heaven, the music began to play, and the Holy Spirit of Graceland slipped away. I saw the king. Coming home to meet his maker I saw the king He was headed for the promised land Pearly gates, gold streets The king at the gates of his mansion Followed my angel Lord, how they could sing Hallelujah I saw the king Highway 51 I saw a ring around the sun I heard the thunder as it rolled across the sky And I knew it was time for me to say goodbye So I did by a big man I saw the king coming home to meet his maker I saw the king and he was headed for the promised land yes he was I saw the king 
at the gates of his mansion Followed by angels Lord, how they could sing I saw the king I saw the king Thank you. Now, when you went to California, you worked at Capitol Records and you were doing copies on the third floor. Now, thinking back to that time and fast forward to 2020, what would you have done different in order to become even more successful? <laughs> well, I just recently wrote a song called Live in the Dream, which is the story of my musical life and had my iPad worked, I would play it for you, but it was, <laughs> it started out leaving Memphis. Uh, um, my mother was a bit of a radio star in the 20s and 30s, and uh, I guess I come by this music thing naturally, but when I moved to California, and because Memphis is a big music town, I moved to California with no particular idea of, of doing this, because for me, it was like being a movie star, you, you know, the silver screen and people who were larger than life and and having met Elvis and all these people who I looked up to. But I I got this job at Capitol Records, my first job, third floor stockroom supervisor, and I was in charge of the Xerox machine, which was the size of a Buick back then. <clears throat> and everybody from the janitor to the president had to come to me for copies, including the lady in the publishing department who who I got to know, and I, and I gave her my, a reel-to-reel -reel of my first six songs that I had written, and they were, they were horrible, I and mean, I, I just can't imagine what she thought, but one of the, the last song that I put on there was a song that rec was recorded by the, um, the Association back then in the 60s and this was 1966 and and because I thought it made my voice my voice sounded good on that song <clears throat> so she played it in her office and this guy this Hollywood producer heard it and he said who's who is that and she said it's the kid in the third floor stock room <laughs> and he said I got a track for that song which hadn't been a, a hit for the association it was called don't don't blame the rain or go blame the rain or don't blame it on me or something to blame somebody about something. Um, and I had a major l label record deal within a couple of weeks and and I don't think I'd do anything different because it, <laughs> it, it put me within, oh, let's say, a month of that happening, driving down Sunset Boulevard in my... 66 Volkswagen on my way to Capitol Records to go to work. And I and my voice came on the radio singing this song, and I had to pull over on Sunset Boulevard right across from the Whiskey A Go-Go <laughs> to listen to myself. And I told my wife about it, and she said, well, you can quit your job now. <laughs> and, and she said, you quit your job and write songs, and I'll get a job which she did, and we were living on the beach in Southern California, and I'd get up in the morning. She worked for CBS television, which was great. She was in charge of the department where all the stars would come in and they'd okay their photographs that had been taken when, when they were performing at whatever show they were on. So we got to go to all these great CBS shows, the Smothers Brothers and um, Glenn Campbell and whatever. I don't know whether I'm getting way off the topic, but uh, this is my... I don't know if these stories are true, but they happen to me, kind of a thing. 
Um, and, and so I, I, that began my career as a, a writer for real. And I had a Neil Young and Joni Mitchell's manager became my manager, and I got to sleep in Joni Mitchell's bed and write songs on her piano and um, met Neil, who gave me a reel-to-reel of songs that a year later would all be on the, his song, his album Harvest. So I played them for a year before he did, and when Heart of Gold came out, people were saying, Neil Young's still one of your songs. Because <clears throat> I wouldn't tell them that... <laughs> that I I didn't write it, but it was a it was a fantasy world. It was living a dream that I never that I never dreamed because I couldn't imagine doing that or doing this. This is fifty something years later, and I'm still doing this, and and it's thrilling. You yeah. know, you just can't stop, can you? <laughs> no. <laughs> now. Uh... You lived in California and not only worked in the pop scene, but had some considerable success there with some with some hits. And uh, then you worked in the country scene in Nashville as a staff songwriter and, and songwriter. And now here in Texas since ooh, 12, 13 years. What, uh, in which of these communities did you feel like most incorporated, most welcome, or is it just because it was different times so everything was good? or? It was all of that, and and I have a song called um, uh, "Well, what it's about is <clears throat> having gone into these different uh, different Memphis, L.A., Nashville, and Austin, four major American music cities, each of which is totally different different orientation and there's a, a story in each of those but um the song talks about where if you've moved around uh, i'll just make this about me but uh, imagine that um when i would move into a town and uh making new friends and and there are these groups of people, let's say cliques, if you will. Or, uh, and and I noticed it here in Austin more than before because I just have some uh, experience behind me now. But there's 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 these, let's say half a dozen at, at least cliques, musical cliques, in here. And but everybody knows each other. But and it's like this in life. Uh, you know, I'm in my group of people, and we fell together for whatever reasons. And um, but we all know everybody, and nobody holds anything against me for being in in this or that group of people. I'm a Scorpio only child, so generally I'm not a click guy. I have friends in all of these cliques. So, um, uh, what were we talking about? Yeah, um, pretty much. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> now, back then, that was actually the, the great years of, you know, the Birds, Graham Parsons, uh, Chris Hillman and stuff like that. Uh, did you ever come across these guys? Or I did, yeah. Uh, because I was there in the 60s. There's a movie uh, recently. Uh, um, it's about... Uh, uh, Laurel Canyon. It's about the the sixties that scene in L.A. and all of those people I met through playing at the at the uh, Troubadour, um, playing nights with Glenn Fry and Don Henley and Jackson Brown and Joni and these people who went on to be gigantic stars. And I, um, um, yeah, they were wonderful back then. They're still. Uh, accessible I can um, I don't really have much to say to them you know I can thank Neil Young for giving me <laughs> that tape and thank Joni for letting <laughs> me stay in her house and, um, and Jackson Brown for listening to him bang out a chorus or a verse for an hour and then just to get it right and I thought when I heard when I heard that back then, I thought, God, that guy is—he's just obsessed. And now I do the same thing, and my wife 
my studio's upstairs, and she says, um, I don't think she's listening, you know, but she, she can hear it all, and she gets really tired of the songs and very quickly. <laughs> it's also kind of a learning process. Yeah. All right, let's play another one. Okay. Uh, uh, let's see if I can do this. Um, so I have a, a, a record called We're All Naked. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's got a picture of me, age 60, naked on the front, holding my guitar, Cover it sort of like in the like this, spot. You know, like that. <laughs> but um, this is it's it's song, <clears throat> love songs all about this wonderful woman who was my sweetheart then. Um, naked truth about love uh, songs. Little Billy told a lie to his mom and dad Late that night he felt so bad Found the courage to face his fears Told the truth, cried big tears and Mama said, son, I'm proud of you Then she told him a story that I'll tell you Said we are all naked beneath our clothes Below the surface where no one goes Behind the veil, deep down, there's a place where the truth is always found. You can fool the world, you will know, you can hide the truth, but it'll show. You can act like an angel, smell like a rose, but we're all naked beneath our clothes. Everybody got trouble, everybody got pain Every now and then, you got to have a little rain The sun don't shine every single day And when that cold wind blows your way You got to find a safe place inside your head Just remember what little Billy's mama once said She said, we are all naked beneath our clothes Below the surface where no one goes Behind the veil, deep down, is a place where the truth is always found. You can fool the world, but you will know you can hide the truth. But it'll show you can act like an angel, smell like a rose. We're all naked <laughs> beneath our clothes. Said we're all naked in the eyes of the one who knows everything we ever done. From the top of our head to the tip of our toes, we're all naked beneath our clothes. Now, little Billy. Uh oh. Now, little. Uh, now, little Billy. What? What happened to little Billy? Um. <laughs> Mm, where's my iPad? Not um, uh, Not a little, anyway. Little Billy's dad says uh, something, and Billy answers, and then it's kind of goes into we are all naked beneath our clothes below the surface where no one goes behind the veil deep down is a place where the truth is always found you can fool the world but you will know you can hide the truth but it'll show you can act like an angel smell like a rose but we're all naked beneath our clothes I said, we are all naked <laughs> beneath our clothes. I said, we are all naked. <laughs> it's going to get worse. Yeah. <laughs> Now, if that, that's what happens if you write more than 3,000 songs, you know? You kind of... That's normal, I guess. Well, it, it, the thing is, I used to I used to know these songs. I used to know, know, know them, and then um, 
they started, I started writing more. And I, I just, I was telling them, uh, from my house to here, I talked Skype to my friend in England who's dying, Dave Greaves. I talked to him every day. And uh, we were talking about um, how he, when I write a song, I, I do a little guitar vocal of it and then maybe empty the garbage and make the bed or whatever I do between songs and then I'm on to the next song and I haven't learned the one that I wrote like those fun there's just no way to keep up and this exactly. is the this thing <laughs> is the only way that I can keep up <laughs> and this is what happens when that thing rejects me it's out. now that's actually the, the, the second part of the question because okay. With more than 3,000, how do you still find new material without suddenly realizing, oh, shit, I've done that? Is, uh, how does that work? Well, boy, that's a good question. And I, I guess it would be that there's every moment. Uh, I have a song called Every Moment is a Miracle. <laughs> and every song is. And... and uh, I think every feeling is, while I may have the same emotions or have been through similar situations, the, one of my missions as a songwriter, obviously, is to make uh, a new twist and a new update on whatever I'm writing about. Um, and I've, I've been fortunate enough, some people can't do it. I've been... And you could... You could find a hundred songs of mine that sound like another hundred, you mm. know. But after you write several thousand songs, it doesn't matter anymore. That was a good Buddy Holly song. It doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> right. Okay, let's shoot for the next one, whatever that... <laughs> I couldn't even read that, so hopefully yeah. you can. <laughs> I may be out of, um, out of this drop D thing... Uh, there's a song that I, I would really like to play. Um, so can I just play a little bit of it and sure. I, I get as, <laughs> through as much of it as I can? Uh, I wasn't born into money No silver spoon in my mouth No land of milk and honey For this young boy from the south My college education Came from my mama's sweat and blood She was my inspiration And I was the prize of our neighborhood I learned the value of a dollar from my granddad who raised four kids back in the Great Depression where so many good folks hit the skids so let's see if I can do the chorus I am a patriot born in the USA Patriot, and that's all I can remember of that song. Um, mm, mm. <laughs> and I played it all over the world, and in, in England um, and in Europe, Patriot means a different thing. Patriot means what maybe John Wilkes Booth would have meant in America. A, a, a guy, a, maybe... You know, or the skinheads, if you will. I don't think there's any skinheads in here. Or neo-Nazis, you know. <laughs> or that na nationalism, you know, where America is so right that we need to cleanse it from the, the people that are wrong. And that's what, for some people, patriot patriotism means. Anyway, I was warned against playing this on my last tour 
which was in November, and uh, and uh, at a certain point, I said, "No, I'm going to play it," and and it got the best result of any song. Um, it's just such a powerful song, and I'm sorry I, I can't play it. But you get the idea. No, you just celebrated your 76th birthday. Is there any plan for retirement, or, or you keep going just until you fall off the stage? Or? I think that's going to happen tonight. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> no, no plans. Uh, I just, um, sorry. Last year was a really bad year for me health-wise. I had uh, major spine surgery and major hand surgery within a month of each other. And it took me, it's taken me a year to, to get back sort of to level. My back will never be the same. I can't do a lot of things that I'm supposed to, that I used to be able to do. My hand works. I can play, so that's good. Um, I just got out of five months, five weeks of pneumonia. Um, my ear went deaf in this ear they had to lance it and suck the stuff out and then and i had to cancel my double hernia operation so um, <laughs> just everything at once so right? was your question about uh, <laughs> retiring yeah but there was only one way keep Other going that, right? Lincoln, how did you like to play <laughs> thanks you know um it's still here and and uh, I remember um, when I was making records in Hollywood, my producers wanted me to sing really high because I can sing really high. But but I got to go on tour with Johnny Cash, and he recorded a song of mine, and and you know he sings really low. And when um, I'll just never forget this, they he had these he had of his manager and a handler, and they would walk him to the stage to the curtains and they'd take his long coat off and give him a shove and he'd walk out and grab the mic said hello I'm Johnny Cash and so I'm kind of singing low these days because they actually cheated you out of a lot of money because he never put it on the album right they yes. didn't let him yes <laughs> it's a song which I which I'll attempt to play <laughs> called River of Jordan and I had uh I was sitting in my rocking chair. This was when I was in California living. And jo uh, Dolly Parton was singing a song on, what was it? Uh, not YouTube. What was the thing, uh, the early, <clears throat> when you make a music video? Uh, MTV. MTV. Probably, yeah. So the, it was a three and a half minute song. And in three and a half minutes, I wrote this song, which I may be able to play And and it was about a river, and her song was about a river, so that I went to Tower Records the next day to see if I had completely stolen her song, and I hadn't. Um, so it was on a record called Gettysburg to Graceland, which is out there in, somewhere in the living room, <clears throat> with a picture of my grandmother on it, by the way, uh, which was... A, a hand tinted photograph of her from she was born in 1889 the picture was taken no the picture was taken in 1889 when she was 22 years old <clears throat> she's a beautiful young lady and uh, <clears throat> after I'd moved to Nashville or when I moved to Nashville from California where I had a publishing deal with Criterion Music and And the other art, the other writers in Criterion Music were Jackson Brown, Lyle Lovett, <coughs> Rodney Ka Crowell, jo uh, Roseanne Cash, um, you know, some really big writers than me. <coughs> um, where was I going with that? Um, oh, oh yeah. So when I moved to Nashville where most of those people live, Jackson lives in L.A., but my publisher said, I want you to write for the country market. So that meant writing three minutes, three minutes and 20 second songs. You have 15 second intro by the first minute, you're into the chorus. Um, second verse has to go somewhere. There's a beginning, middle, and an ending to the stories, and then you're out in three minutes and 20 seconds. It's like writing... 
It, it's just impossible. No, it's not impossible because I've learned to do it. But after a, about a year and a half, he said, because um, my country songs written for the country market were were weak versions of what he wanted me to. He wanted me to write hit songs, radio hits. I went into the Warner Brothers um, record company and played. He said, play me. Play me your best song. So I played him, I gave him a cassette, and he put it on. It was a six-minute version of my song, Caleb Leedy, the Ballad of Caleb Leedy, which is also on that Gettysburg New Relation record. And he said, well, first chorus came, he shut it off. He said, that's not a hit song. I said, you didn't say hit. You said play my, what I thought was my best song, which it, I still think that's one of my best songs. I think every writer has several masterpieces. I have The Ballad of Caleb Leedy, Old Soul. I forgot to put that on there. And um, maybe another one. Anyway, so my publisher at that point said, a year and a half later, he said, I want you to go back to writing Bob Cheever songs because that's where your strength is and that's why I hired you. Big albatross off my neck because I was trying really hard to write things that weren't natural for me and um, so I went back to writing songs that I wrote naturally and made the record Gettysburg to Graceland um, which was a big record for me and uh, Johnny Cash's manager heard River of Jordan and Cash recorded it Um, I remember being in my studio in Nashville and my wife and I were having this argument because when we moved there, there was this five-year plan. <clears throat> it takes about five years to connect, connect the dots, climb the ladder, get somewhere, make something happen. I was sitting at the table. She put a one ads in front of me, and I said, what's this? And she said, well, it's, it's one ads. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, it's been five years. Um, I said... So you are saying, I need to get a job. And she said, well, yeah, you said five years. And I said, well, it's not exactly five years, give or take. (laughs) So we were down in my studio, and we were almost coming to blows about this five-year thing, and the phone rang. And it was Keith Sykes, one of my friends I grew up with in Memphis, who was who was pitching my songs, and he had pitched this song, River of Jordan, to Johnny Cash, and he so, Keith, I was trying to fight my wife off, and Keith said, Bob, uh, Cash is recording your song tomorrow. Thanks. I let the phone told her we're dancing in my studio. No Everything's H- fine. <laughs> <clears throat> so a year or so went by. Cash, after that record was made, he went to... He went to uh, wherever the promised land is you know on a spiritual quest and he came back with a completely different idea of what he wanted to do so he shelved all the songs on that record and my song never got came out and I talked to Buddy Cannon who produced that record this was 1999 98 he can't find it I think Cash's family has the the um you know, all the Rachel tapes and stuff. And, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so, That's what you call bad luck. <laughs> very disappointing, but I got to go on tour with him, and, and more sadly for him than me, uh, one night he dropped his pick, and he bent over to pick it up, and he fell over, and that was the last show that he ever played. Mm-hmm. And so there went his career, and it sort of put a dent in what I thought could be uh, open a lot of doors for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not holding that against him. (laughs) Not anymore. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Uh, Shall I see if I can play River of Jordan? Yeah, let's shoot for another one, then. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, okay. Help me if I forget this. Help me, God. 
There's a river that flows outside Atlanta Down to the backwoods, Louisiana And to the <laughs> it baptizes sinners on Sunday And it flows all over the world I'll get the course River of Jordan Fountain of hope Take all the sorrow and Wind like a rope to all of your grace Right through this garden Wash all our sins away In the river of Jordan And the bridge is something like this And we pray For a better understanding And for love and peace all over the world River of Jordan Fountain of hope Take all our sorrow Wind like a rope With all of your grace Grant us a pardon Free us today On the banks Of the River of Jordan Part of it anyway <laughs> Now, people can come see you every week at the infamous brewing company in Austin. Uh, do you prefer, like, these regular gigs versus some kind of random stuff because it kind of guarantees a regular check? or Some kind of, what was some random stuff? Yeah, the random gigs that um, come in. Well, I love to play. I, one of the problems that I've had, I'm having now, my doctors don't want, want me to stop. They want me to retire. Um I made a pact uh, when I was about 70, which was six years ago, and it just doesn't seem like that's possible to play and sing as much as I possibly could because I would rather do that than anything. I get the endorphins, you know, and uh, there's just nothing like it in playing for people who listen, who come to hear what I have to say and what I have to sing about. Is There's just nothing like it, and... Um, then there's the other side, the infamous brewery, and um, the, the places um, at the Oasis. I play four times a month at the Oasis for two hours at sundown, because if you've been to the Oasis, thousands of mm. people every day, sundown. So there I'm playing, and they want me to play really loud, which no venue person ever wants me to do. <laughs> And the reason is because it's all open air mm -hmm. and they want the music to uh, bring people in. Well, it's a giant PA, and since I've been playing there, this ear thing is its just crazy. Because anyway, um, I've cut my teeth in smoky bars fighting for the airwaves. So I love doing that. I mm -hmm. love playing an infamous one. My job at these places is to get somebody to listen. And every time, mm -hmm. somebody will listen. And invariably, well, every single time I play, and I'm, I'm betting somebody here is thinking, because they'll come up and say, Bob, you know who you sound like? Anybody? <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> Yes, I know I sound like Willie, and uh, in fact, I have a song called You Sound Just Like Willie. Yeah, I know that one, though. I know that one. And I could maybe play a verse of it. Go Let's ahead. See. <laughs> uh, 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 oh, maybe not. <laughs> um, The first line, uh, I love the redheaded stranger and the way he lives life on his bus, laughing and loving, singing and playing. When you meet him, why, he's just like one of us. From the, from the, from the something of Nashville, 
to the bed of you. I can just sing the chorus, Lord. When I sing, people say, you sound just like Willie. I don't try to do it. It just comes out that way. How often I hear you sound just like Willie, but I'm a Tennessee hillbilly, and I smile when folks say you sound just like Willie. Let's see if we can get anywhere with this. No. <laughs> 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 now, when you look at today's young songwriters in Texas that you obviously meet every now and then at a gig, how often do you see talent that could once feel like the shoes of Guy Clark's or Towns Van Zandt's or other people? Rarely. Um, my favorite songwriters are Kevin Welch. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but he's Walt been around Wilkins. for 35 years. <laughs> um And those two guys, uh, Walt's from Texas. When I was living in Nashville, have you ever heard Walt Wilkins, anybody? No, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. um, we were friends in, in Nashville, and when he was going to move back to Texas, we we all said, why? Yeah, why? He moved back in 2005, I think. Yeah. And And, of course, when I moved here and I found out I found out why he moved back because the the music scene is uh, having grown up as a in the music business for me living and working in L.A. and living and working in Nashville. Somebody's always looking over your shoulder to make sure you're writing the right stuff, and if you're an artist that you're looking right and that you're. This didn't happen to me, but they have you know nowadays they. <clears throat> Have people who groom you to be a celebrity and tell you what to wear and what to say and how to do mm -hmm. interviews. And obviously, I don't have a lot of trouble doing interviews, but um, it was just um, so many. One of the biggest differences in Texas writers and. It, this is unfair, but writers in the music business who've had big success is so so many Texas writers, they don't write verse chorus stuff. They write just less than that. <clears throat> and they've driven it into me to be a commercial success that I have to write verse chorus, verse chorus, yada, yada. I want to explain it a little bit earlier. Moving to Texas, though, I've been able to lighten up a bit. And, um, in fact, several songs I've written lately, which I was going to play, um, don't have choruses. Mm. And and I have stories, a, yeah. the one that I was telling you about a minute ago my, about my music career. It's over 10 minutes long. <laughs> mm. I love it. Yeah. Course, that's it, what you need the iPad for right? yeah well, <laughs> 10 minutes of lyrics but that that's exactly the problem that you describe you know the people groom these up and coming artists and they all sound alike they look alike they got the same studio yeah. musicians it's just nuts yeah and and here it's way different but I'm talking more about I mean Walt is in the business for 30 years almost and and Kevin who lives in Wimbledon now I think right now he's back in California isn't he I don't know. I can't keep up that, with him. Uh, but he's in Wimbledon, and he's got a home down there, and he's around forever. But yeah. when I'm, I'm more talking like about you know the guys between like twenty and thirty that you meet on the road playing, or what about twenty or thirty? Like young talents kids? where you can say, yeah, these guys are really up and coming. They could actually develop into something. I see. Um, I don't really meet many people. Um, musicians and uh, I'm always playing um, it's funny here in Austin really anywhere I've lived 
because most of my friends are musicians and they're always playing like I am. We don't, I don't get to see my friends play and they don't come to see me play. And it irritated the hell out of me and still does <laughs> sometimes, but I just have to remember, well, they're playing and, and when I'm not playing, I don't want to go anywhere. I want to stay home. Mm-hmm. So that's that part of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Let's play another one then. Okay. I might know this one. Uh, <laughs> this is called When the Leaves Turn Gold, and it's on. Uh, it's also on that We Are All Naked record. And <clears throat> I've told this story a million times, and my wife thinks that it's a dumb story because it doesn't have a. It's anticlimactic. Climactic. And, um, but this girl, Suzanne. We were together for five years. She wanted, she loved me, but she wanted a rich me. And about every six months, she'd break up with me and put herself back on the market. And <laughs> nothing happened, and she'd come back to me, and I and I loved it. And I'd, so the first time that happened, I mean, it was it devastated me. And so when she when she took me back. <laughs> And we're still dear friends. And, and one of the great things about me, if you, if you want to know, just one great thing is that all the women that I've loved and who've loved me still love me, and I still love them. And that's <laughs> rare. And every almost every single one of them, uh, when I'm with them, they don't like it because of these other women who I've loved and still love until we're not together anymore, and then they're really... <laughs> Happy that we still love each other. But you're lucky not all your exes live in Texas, That's right. right. (laughs) In fact, none of them. Only (laughs) I hope this one isn't my ex. This is my third marriage, and she's a Texas girl. And she's 24 years younger than me. She's just turned 53. So she said one of the things that she said, one of the most wonderful things anything's anybody has ever said to me is, I want to take care of you when you get old. This was eight years ago when we got together. So needless to say, recently I said, okay, (laughs) time has come. (laughs) Because this last year, it's just been, it's just been devastating for me. And she can't hear what my doctors say. They say retire. She says, Bob, work harder. Because I'm half, she's got a, six-figure job, and I don't know why she worries about money, and I guess there's the thing about, well, it's that white knight thing, you know, uh, somebody is going to come along, and and she was with a fucking multi-millionaire before she was with me, but she didn't like him, and it, and it didn't care about the money, and she doesn't care about money, but she wants me to make more money. I yeah, know. but she wants you probably to keep busy, too. Because otherwise, you know, when you stop doing what you love doing, then, you know, what well, do you I'm do? in the studio every day of my life, eight, ten hours a day mm-hmm. doing what I love and and making money. I mean, I'm, it's not like I'm not making money. It's just I'm not making as much as I used to make. <laughs> She's Everybody making more does. than she ever made and more than I ever made. Mm-hmm. Anyway. <laughs> Um, this is a song that I played when Suzanne took me back, and I played her this song, and and I said, "Man, I'm, I'm so excited! I just wrote this for you." And she listened to it, and she said, "Bob, you sure have an imagination." So that it's the biggest laugh I've ever gotten, and. Um, <laughs> Somebody said Willie should do this song. June and July flew by my window. Next thing I knew, the trees were bare. Being with you, there's all these rainbows. It could be dark and cold. Why should I care? I have this old coat I wear 
And I know you will be there with me When the leaves turn gold I believe and I have learned The flame between you and me will burn When the leaves turn gold You read your book, I play my piano Rain coming down like it was the end of the world You give me that look like where did the time go baby My head answers, I don't know But my heart says I love you so we will grow old holding each other when our story is told. Folks will say they say together through every kind of weather. I have this old coat I wear. I know you will be there. With me when the leaves turn gold I believe in I learn the flame between you and me will burn when the leaves turn gold that old flame will burn when the leaves turn gold When the leaves turn gold. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta do a whole song. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, a few years back, you put out the CD collection, 50 years, and uh, for anybody who hasn't got it, it's like 80 songs across his 50-year career. Uh, it's a pretty good CD box. And uh, there's also an album which actually reduces that down to like 20, I think. Uh, the the, the, um, the 50 years thing, the selection. 10. Yeah. It's, it's sort of a sampler yeah. thing. And then 2018, you put out Bob on a Stick. <laughs> yeah. How the hell did you get to that title? Um, <laughs> Well, it's on a memory stick, um, 14 songs. <laughs> it just seemed perfect. Uh, and that was, what, three or four years ago? Yeah, 2018, um, I think. <laughs> I thought I was ahead of the curve. People would just buy it because, you know, now if you have a fairly new car, there's no CD player in it. You have this USB port. Mm -hmm. Stick it in there. Did it work? Absolutely sold just about nothing. Mm -hmm. Weird, huh? It's just about enough. 14 but, fabulous songs. But, but you're still selling CDs, so it's kind of weird. Some people tell me CDs don't sell anymore. Some people... It, yeah. Um, what is it? I, I don't know. Uh, the, the download thing is the way, the mm -hmm. way of the world yeah, nowadays. Yeah, but that doesn't pay anything. You know? No. Almost. Um, <laughs> and I sell a few CDs now and then, but I've... Uh, I've taken to giving stuff away because I have a garage, hundreds of boxes of CDs that. Because when you when I make a record, I'll uh, the first run is a thousand. Usually, the, the, I have to make, make several runs of the thousand. Well, back in the day when they were selling, now <clears throat> the last. The last three CD, three CDs, three CDs I've made, three records I've made, have all been in California with my dear friends who I've recorded and written and performed with for 35 years. They said, "Why don't we record some of your songs?" So each year we've we've gone into the studio where we've all worked for years. Studio gives me three days. Eight or ten of my best friends who are fabulous musicians and singers come in and I send them 
like 15 songs to think about and listen and none of that they don't learn the songs they wait till the day we get in the studio they may 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 write out a chord sheet but they don't learn it we just play it on the spot we run it a couple of times then push the button and it it goes right right into the computer to a stereo program and there's no fixes or no mixes it's just all live and it's one microphone an AEA R88 ribbon mic for those of you who are microphone savvy <laughs> um, it's right in the middle of the room it's a microphone about that big it's actually got two microphones in it and they face you know mm -hmm. that way and they're 360 so we sit around it and the, <clears throat> the engineer guy will place us all so that it sounds right so it, those are all downloads except for that bob on a stick which is actually a download too but there's if you got a car with a USB and you're really poor and you just would really like to take home one of those in fact any of those CDs out there <laughs> take them with you Against, well, of course uh, unless you want to support an artist whose wife wants him to make more money you know there's that <laughs> exactly <laughs> Now, is there any kind of new project coming this year, or what's what's the idea? Except the Los Angeles thing. Um, I was telling Dave Greaves on the way here, um, I want to make a record of these Dad Gad mm -hmm. songs. And he and I, um, <clears throat> I've known him 20 years. He was an extraordinary musician, and I didn't find out he was a songwriter till I visited him in November. He lives in Scarborough, England. Remember that song, Are You Going to Scarborough, Scarborough Fair? Fair yeah. I didn't know where that was, and, but uh, <laughs> it's in England. He lives on the right on the edge of the North Sea. You can walk across the road to the North Sea. Um, his, on my way out of his house that day, it's interesting because I, th I was going to visit a legend when I went to visit him in November. I didn't know he had this MSA disorder. And um, when I got there, his partner told me what he had, and he was had a lot of trouble getting around. He can't play guitar anymore or do almost anything. But on my way out, he gave me four CDs that he had made over the years, and, and the songs are just mind-bendingly wonderful. Speaking of finding the new writer, mm -hmm. I've been so encaptured by his songs that I've listened to them every single day since November. And... Um, and I put together the double disc 22 song thing for him, which will come out November 20th worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, March 20th. But um, there was a point there uh, talking about um, uh, new projects. Oh yeah, no. uh, he, uh, because of his <laughs> imminent death. The, the 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 thing that has changed his life is our friendship and us talking every day and we've written four songs together so far in the last month <laughs> and we've made a pact <clears throat> to write 10 songs and make a Dave and Bob record so cool it would be good wow that choked me up <laughs> yeah I understand. All right, let's play another one. <clears throat> let's play this one. <clears throat> <laughs> That's <right>. These are. <laughs> That's not his girlfriends. No. <laughs> um, it's about this song, which is a big cult hit <clears throat> in Europe, and so the the, the ladies. They know it's coming because they come to. This is one of the reasons they come to my shows. Uh, it's, it's funny. Uh, my publisher, when I moved to Nashville, he said, "Don't <coughs> play your novelty songs because then you'll become known as a novelty songwriter, and that's not what we want." So a couple of years after I moved to Nashville, not becoming known really for anything, I started playing my novelty songs and became known as a novelty songwriter <laughs> because of this song. So so they'll come and they'll throw these at me and I save them till I get to customs. 
and my guitar. I put, leave them in my guitar case. So the good customs guy opens my guitar case, and there's uh, any number of these things, and I leave them with with the with the customs guy. They won't let me take them into America. Isn't that funny? Now, why? Would, you know, they ask you, um, have you been to any? Have been to, near any farm animals? Have you been to a ranch? Have you uh, been out in the country and gotten mud on your shoes? Especially back, remember the, we didn't have it here, but they called it mad cow disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That happened when I was over there. And, um, well, you can imagine. So we had this thing in Nashville called uh, Song Mania each month. And that's 16 hit songwriters divided up into four and each songwriter would play their stupidest song they'd ever written or whenever they'd written it and the audience would vote on a on a winner and then the three losers had to give an excuse why their song lost and then the audience would vote on the on the the, the excuse well my song went one in the song round and at the end it lost with my excuse one Maybe it was something in the water from the town of my youth That accounts for the weird little habit some folks call uncouth Started back in high school, continues today My thing about undergarments got a little carried away Well, underpants, underpants, I love my girlfriend's underpants Underpants, underpants, I just love my girlfriend's underpants. I dig through her dirty clothes every time I get the chance. Try them on, do a little dance. Yeah, I love my girlfriend's underpants. <laughs> well, I was never really much into baseball. Had other things on my mind. Thinking about my girlfriend. And what covered her behind? You see, I had this reputation. It was hard to explain. I was born with this condition called lingerie on the brain. Well, underpants, underpants. I love my girlfriend's underpants. Underpants, underpants. I just love my girlfriend's underpants. I dig through her dirty clothes every time I get the chance. Try them on. Do a little dance, yeah, I love my girlfriend's underpants The first time she dropped her linen In the hamper by the bathroom door I just stood there grinning And I had this feeling I'd never had before All brought on by underpants Underpants, and it goes on through the course again and um, that's that song, and I'm not going to sing the end of it because it's just after a while, you know. So usually I ask the audience to sing. So uh, join with me on the chorus, okay, just the boys. So underpants, <laughs> underpants, I love my girlfriend's underpants. See, that's pretty good for boys. And then the girls, underpants, underpants, I love my girlfriend's underpants. That's not bad, see? See how fun that was? So what was the what was the closing verse? <laughs> um, <laughs> who said that? Question oh. time. <laughs> now that was probably a good example because he told me once that he doesn't write songs, but they come to him whenever he has enough space in his head, right? I forgot um, that, yeah. You make notes of everything. Walk us through the oh, process yeah. of like such a song that you recently well, wrote. Yesterday, I got a call saying, uh, uh, can you be here at one instead of uh, two or whatever it was? Three, yeah. And I said, sure, but I need to make a note of that. And David said, a note? That's only 24 hours away, but I have my... I'm, y'all tell me that y'all do this, but you make post-it notes, you know. Of course. <laughs> I mean, we're... Yeah, so... Um, notes. 
yeah, song titles. Um, somebody says something, I'll say to myself or to you, that sounds like a song title. And in, um, in Nashville, writing for the country market and writing for publishing companies every day, I'd have to go into a meeting at 10 or or 12 or 2 or whatever <clears throat> with a stranger or a friend and with a blank sheet of paper. And we'd sit there and, you know, there's a lot of looking at your watch back when people wore watches. And then you go to, you go to lunch and your guard's down, you're not on the clock and you're talking about your life or whatever. And that thing comes up. There's something we should go back to write about. Mm -hmm. Go back in the afternoon. There you go. Um, anything in the world could trigger me um, and does. And, you know, just from what you've heard, the variety of songs uh, on this 50 years, there's eight, eight genres of songs that, it, that I write in. Jazz, folk, rock whatever story song mm -hmm. blues yeah um hillbilly country uh um i i've written uh i have amassed and i didn't know this until i'm putting together probably 25 protest songs i've been writing a lot in the last couple of years because of, of my particular feelings about what's going on mm -hmm. in america Mm, and um, novelty songs every now and then. I have a couple of great novelty <coughs> songs. One mm -hmm. is uh, called "I Want My Foreskin Back," <laughs> which uh, <laughs> which is on this. Well, well it's probably not. Gonna, probably not gonna, it's a, it's very very funny. <laughs> Now that's probably something you should do. You you get a big truck and you get a keepsake for every song that you wrote, like those underpants, because realize that he knew the whole lyrics once he saw these underpants. It, it works. <laughs> so you need to get all that stuff into your van, and then you just grab ten articles and you you play the songs. So what what would I uh, what would I uh, use for I want my foreskin back? That's a good question. <laughs> that is a really good question. <laughs> Or I not don't so know. much. Maybe go to a Jewish store and no! ask for one. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, it mentions that. It says, well, I, yeah, it's just, it's just anyway. Uh. How, do you, how do you, when you, you get a song in your mind, how do you put the song and the music together? Is if it's 2-4 uh, or, you know, I don't understand, or I'm having difficulty understand the words going and they sound good and it's a nice poem, but how do you select the music and the keys to make it mm. come together, to make it... Yeah. Well, it's very organic and it's different for everybody and in fact it's different every song for me. Uh, last night, um, I found this old lyric and in my wonderful Dad Gad tuning, the first string that I hit it started the song, and and how do I know that? I don't have any idea. I don't know any of that. I don't know is the answer. I don't know. It comes. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody knows. And if they say, it's yeah. If they say they know, then they they're just it's just for them, you know. So it's very subjective. Every song. It's a, it's a great question though. <coughs> mm -hmm. and, and like, where does creativity come from? Where do you? How do you? Um, muster it or corral it or um, how to uh, I, I wrote a song the other day that um, um, the first line was uh, uh, something like uh, some things are better left left unsaid and that word that sentence came into my mind and I again picked up this guitar and the chords it's off and running, but where do I go from there? And um, somehow the next line just comes, and this was going to be about, it was going to be more of a song about not knowing maybe 
what's going on in life or how to what how, how am how am I going to deal with this? But it turned into this lovely love song about my wife, <laughs> and and uh, it's called Things. It's like things. Uh, I, I don't. I can't remember any of it, of course, but um, yeah. yeah. Can't let the song lead where it where it leads you. Yeah? Let the song get you where it leads to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything it le- anything can lead to anything. All right. Okay, let's play another one. Oh, okay. Before we get to now that, that you mentioned it, last uh, question thing. <laughs> uh, only child. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> In 2011, three years after I'd moved here, I won the Texas Music Awards Singer Songwriter of the Year, which was absolutely wonderful. That's where we met the first time, actually. <laughs> and at three years after I moved to Texas, I'm not a Texas guy. Come on, guys, you got to give this to somebody that's from Texas. Um, but the record that I had made that I submitted that was part of the judging process was called Tall Texas Tales. And this song was on it. And I remember um, there's a guy named George Inslee. There's Mm -hmm. a guy named Tim Henderson. Tim died years ago. Tim was driving my 22-foot Winnebago. It was February. We were on our way back to Memphis for what's called Folk Alliance, National Folk Alliance. It was probably 20 degrees. George and I were in the back where there was no heat. We were wrapped up in blankets. And I was writing this song, and he said, he said, that second verse, you need to change it. And I said, why? And he said, well, it's because it's about um, Kennedy being shot in Dallas. It's about, um, so, oh, <laughs> The the thing in Waco that went sideways, you know, which my wife happened to work with the people after that. She works for Child Protective Services, but um, I said, "Why those things happen?" And they're they're Texas things. And he says, "Because we don't want to hear about them." I thought, well, hmm, that makes sense. <laughs> so I changed it. So the second verse is different now. I was telling my friend Dave on my way over here, driving up Highway 35, which is just a nightmare. And he said, how? He said, doesn't that go all the way through Texas? And I said, well, I think it goes from San Antonio to Dallas. Much up to Oklahoma. Does it go past Dallas? Oh, yeah, yeah. Where does it go? They're way up Kansas, all over. All wow. up. It's sort of like Highway 5 goes from Santa Monica to, was it Miami or Fort Lauderdale, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. This song, when I play it in Texas, for big audiences or little audiences, and, and I'm just telling you this, uh, after it, Texas people give me a standing ovation for this song. Don't do it. <laughs> now, but but anywhere else, Texas, and and for me, when I, before I moved here, Texas didn't mean anything to me, except a bunch of arrogant people who think they're better than anybody else. In Texas, everything's bigger. True. And <laughs> and then I moved here, and I, you know, year after year, I've been getting it, and um. And Texas people are wonderful, and and I love the idea that Texas people feel that way about their state, and it's like nowhere else in the world, really. That's just what I think. Uh, okay. There's a stretch of open highway called I-35. Takes you straight through Dallas if you manage to survive. The small town state troopers who drive that interstate, clocking 18 wheelers and checking them for weight. Hurricanes hit the Gulf Coast, part of Galveston disappeared. T shirts saying, Keep Austin weird. Texas is an only child, a real lone star, but you can be your friend no matter who you are. 
the Alamo still stands, her rivers running wild. The great state of Texas is an only child, just like me, only child, Memphis, Tennessee. Remember Santa Ana? His pants down to his knees With the yellow rose of Texas Doing all she could to please Towns with names like Waco Towns who found this fame Singing about banditos Pancho and Lefty were their names Davy Crockett, Hoodoo Wars Tales of Texas Gold Then came Buddy Holly And the rest is rock and roll Texas is an only child A real old star But you can be your friend No matter who you are The Alamo still stands The river's running wild The great state of Texas Is an only child Lone Star Independence Alive and well today Life is bigger here That's what people say the sound of the Deguayo Turn young boys into men Long horns in the goal line of Texas A&M Willie's on his tour bus And he is rolling up a He could get his hair cut But, but, but What would be the point? Faded red bandana Beat up old guitar Singing Whiskey River While Kinky smokes cigars Legends from El Paso To the Louisiana Forget today is a Georgia on oh my, my mind. Texas is an only child, a real old star. But you can be your friend no matter who you are. The Alamo still stands, a river running wild. The great state of Texas is an only child. The great state of Texas, where is it? Is an only child. Yeah. Texas music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <coughs> All right. So, as usual, before we go to the last one, we ask the people here if they have any questions for you. Did you know Bill Williams that worked for Capitol? What year did he, was he there, do you know? I'm not sure. He signed guys like Charlie Rich and people like that. That era. Early 70s. I was there in the middle 60s, so. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. That was the last millennium, so, you know. <laughs> these guys are too young for that you know? well and at these record companies you know about every 20 minutes it's like musical yeah, yeah. chairs and they're <laughs> yeah. one less chair one less company right. one bigger label yeah. bigger label even bigger always I got a question. so where's your favorite place to live mm. southern california yeah. absolutely on the beach i would live there again if if i weren't living in Texas, where the, my music is working, where my wife lives, where our grandkids are, and she won't move, and I can't afford it. No one can. <laughs> no. I, I, <laughs> Why would you? <laughs> anyway. I lived in Sacramento for uh, for 15 years, and, uh, and people uh, couldn't afford to live in San Francisco anymore, so they were buying property between San Francisco and Sacramento to live because you couldn't afford, you know, there's rent control out there and in New York and I don't know where there is here, but mm -hmm. you just can't can't live anywhere anymore. Mm -hmm. These days no one wants to go there anyway, so they're all coming here. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So Anybody last question else? is, don't answer the same thing as you did in 2006. <laughs> <laughs> because we just covered that in the last one. If you were to interview yourself, what question would you ask that I did not? Um, are, you, uh, the, are you as happy uh, with what you're doing today uh, as you... Um, what would what would make you happier about your career or your 
I guess, your career since his okay. music. Can you answer, answer that for me? Or no, no you, you should. <laughs> <laughs> you should. Um, <laughs> for years, I, I, I've suffered from, uh, let's see if I can think of the term, um, syndrome. Uh, um, well, it's where where you feel like your insides don't match your outside, uh, if you know what I mean. Uh, <clears throat> um, well, uh, the uh, the thing is that I'm getting at, if I can get at it, is um, cl- cl- this, this ladder. You get to it, and this is this is about life generally. But you get to the next ladder, and my second wife was a hospice nurse and she explained it this way life is a series of boxes when you when this box fills up you drop into the next box and it's empty and you have to fill it up and then it and it goes on like that and that's one of the things i've discovered and and each box that i drop into uh or maybe when when my box is filling up i wish i could like I think of my friend Ray Wiley Hubbard or Kevin Welch or or Walt Wilkins, people who I just love, and they're great guys and they're friends of mine. I don't think my stature is as big and as wide as theirs is. And then I have d- dinner with Ray Wiley Hubbard, and he says, he says, Bob, I'm the poorest famous guy you know. <laughs> so, you know, everybody's got their cross to bear and their albatross and... Um, and I finally, I think I've finally gotten past that where I'm, I'm not wishing that um, that I could be where somebody else is because where where any of us is in life, there's always somebody below us and above mm. us, and always something to look forward to and to be thankful for that we're not there anymore. Yeah, so, true. all right. Hey, Good. thanks, y'all. Let's play the last song, man. <laughs> One for the road. You have one more to go. Okay. <laughs> one more to go. Oh, one more song. Yeah, the final oh, song okay. usually. <laughs> oh. Oh, hmm. no. <laughs> okay, let me see this one fits. Um, I can't read that. Let's try this. <laughs> Down at the end of an old country road There's a place where you can lighten your load Just hang around and drink a Lone Star beer Look, there's not a better place to be down here It's like a town in some old picture show A cool oasis where banditos go Familiar faces where time moves slow The sound of music makes you tap your toes that's what I love about Luke and Buck People come to hang around and talk They get the swagger in the way they walk That's what I love about Luke and Buck Nobody's bothered by hands on a clock Front porch old folks and armchairs rock Windows open and doors unlock That's what I love about Luke and Buck Lukenbach, Alabama. (laughs) (laughs) I spent a month here on a Sunday afternoon Howling at the Texas moon Watching the sunrise with my beautiful girl There's not a better place to be in this world The human race has a long way to go and just in case you wonder how I know I've been to Luke and Bach in early spring It's paradise, folks, it's the real thing That's what I love about Luke and Buck. People come to hang around and talk They get the swagger in the way they walk That's what I love about Luke and Buck. Luke and Buck. Nobody's bothered by hands on a clock Front porch, old folks and armchairs rock. Windows open and doors unlock. That's what I love about Luke and Buck. 
windows open and doors unlock. That's what I love about. That's what I love about. That's what I love about Luchenbach. Now I prefer Schinerbach or Ziegenbach. Thank y'all. All right. <laughs>